So, we have been given uh, a really daunting assignment, <laughs> which is to have a conversation about social media and the internet and how we as a Jewish community should be thinking about these technologies and responding to them. And uh, particularly as we stare at these technologies that are really shaping so many of the fundamental basic elements of human being, um, what the Jewish response should be. So the big tech companies that are all around us here in San Francisco are building products that are uh, unavoidable and that are embedded with implied answers to some of the biggest questions about how we are to live and what is a good life. And that's the challenge we face, but it's also the opportunity because we have this 3,000 year tradition of wisdom about how to live and what is a good life. And so, uh, hopefully that tradition can guide us. And as we uh, have this conversation today, I've been asked to moderate. I'm also gonna be jumping in where appropriate. And I'm hoping that we can help give this room uh, some ideas, not just theoretical but practical, about how we can ensure that this tradition of ours not only survives this tumultuous era that we're just at the beginning of, but thrives in it. So I want to start, uh, David, with yes. you. You wrote a piece, published a piece last week uh, about privacy and the Jewish value of privacy. And you wrote specifically about the halachic prohibition on building a house with its windows facing a neighbor's home. Right. The idea is you don't want to be looking in and invading their privacy, and you want to be protecting your own privacy. Now, I read about that on Facebook, <laughs> which is a company whose entire business model is constructed around convincing all of us to align the windows of our homes. Yes. Right? So I want to ask you a provocative question to start this. Okay. Where do you see the values of Facebook as being incongruous with Jewish values? And are those values so incongruous that perhaps we as Jews should not be on Facebook? Thank you. <laughs> and I'm going to begin in good Jewish fashion by not answering your question. <clears throat> but instead, well, I will answer your question. But instead, I want to direct you. My answer actually has something to do with what's going on right now. Years ago, when we first walked on the moon, E.B. White, an essayist for The New Yorker, Josh was written for, wrote that history changed the day that instead of walking outside and looking at the moon, people saw the moon on their television screens. And I realize there is a projection of people that is more attractive than people. And so I saw that as we walked up here and I looked out at the faces, I saw how many people were looking at our images instead of looking at us, which makes sense because they're bigger, they're clearer, they're more attractive, but there is a built-in inauthenticity to technology. We're not actually that big. There's a built-in inauthenticity to technology that Facebook and Twitter and all social media capitalize on. You don't present yourself authentically, and even the authentic presentation of self is a strategy. Look how vulnerable I am love me for being vulnerable and telling the truth about myself on social media. You can't help escaping the reality that you're presenting yourself to lots of people, which makes it, yes, inauthentic in some very deep way. And so it's partly privacy, but the knowledge that you have no privacy affects the way you behave even privately because now we're all presentational selves. And it didn't used to be that way. Just think of the difference between how you feel out in the world and how you feel the moment you walk in your door. And the sense of relief that you are no longer being constantly observed. And so I would say that observation, I mean, we know this from Heisenberg on, observation inevitably affects the thing observed and all of us are different for that. And so while I wouldn't, I mean, I only have a public Facebook page. I don't have a private Facebook page. 
So everything that I put on Facebook is basically rabbi-ish stuff. Um, but I see on Facebook and on Twitter the extent to which my knowledge that I'm giving this to other people pushes you to be more severe, more radical, more, um, more apodictic, more this is the right way because people get excited by that. So I would say yes, that if someone lives, you know, it's like Buber has this great phrase in I and Thou, you'll forgive the gendered language, but it was 1923. He says, you cannot, without it, an I-it relationship, man cannot live, but one who lives with it alone is not a man. So I would say, yeah, without Facebook, it's very hard to be a modern, but if you don't live apart from social media, deliberately in communities that aren't actually connected by social media, then you can't live an authentic or a Jewish life. Lucy. So first of all, um, as a resident of the Bay Area, I wanted to start by actually welcoming you to San Francisco, but also <laughs> acknowledging the people of the Ohlone Nation on whose land we're now gathering and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and future. Secondly, it is impossible for me to sit here today and have a conversation with you about community and technology and not acknowledge and stand with the Muslim community in the aftermath of what happened in New Zealand. Third, I'm not on Facebook. Mm -hmm. You and should repeat that. You repeat that. <laughs> third, I'm not on Facebook. Uh, but that doesn't matter to Facebook. Right. I am what Facebook refers to as an unregistered user. Any of you who've ever run a business and tried to sell things to certain people, wouldn't it be nice if everyone who didn't play with you could be an unregistered user? What a model that is. I want to take two minutes, if I may, because I run something at Stanford called the Digital Civil Society Lab, because my goal for the next 20 minutes, 27 minutes and 45 seconds, is actually I would like you to leave with three things from me. You'll get more from Josh and David, but three things from me. One is the, what we're actually talking about when we talk about the shorthand of Facebook, because it's not just Facebook. It's digitized data and digital networks. And everyone in this room is dependent on them, and therefore your work is dependent on them, and your ability to achieve your mission as a funder is dependent on some understanding of how these things work. How many people in this room have a cell phone on you? I think that is everybody but me. I don't have one on me. How many of you uh, um, have ever written a line of software code? That, what would you say, about a tenth of the audience? That's okay, right. so the rest of you, and you've probably been told the rest of you that it's too hard, you can't understand it. Well, that's bunk. It's absolutely bunk. If you learned how to read when you were two, you learned how to decode a very complicated symbolic system, and thus you've mastered software code. I'm going to jump down into the audience, so don't worry. Okay, I don't want to scare anybody. But I, and I don't know anybody here, and I also can't see you. So I'm going to ask you, do you have a phone? Yes. May I have it? And could you unlock it, please? <laughs> and your name is Lowell, just for the room. <clears throat> and um, do you have 20 bucks? I don't want your phone. I got a phone. I just need 20 bucks. <laughs> this is a philanthropy conference, right? <laughs> this is the only allowed solicitation. I'll take whatever, it doesn't matter. I'll take the receipt, I don't care. <laughs> 10 bucks, no, no, it's 20 bucks. Okay, so Lisa gave me 20 bucks and Lowell gave me his phone. Who has the 20 bucks and who has the phone? I do, Lucy. Who doesn't? Everybody else, including Lisa and Lowell, okay? But I'm gonna give Lisa back her $20 I'm going to hold on to Lowell's phone because who has Lowell's data? I do. And it's an iPhone. Apple and, oh my God, I, he's actually really did give it to me unlocked. Um, all of the apps, yep, who else? Comcast, okay, the telecoms, the Hilton, the NSA. 
the Russians, the Chinese, right? You know this. You've heard this. I want to make it very real for you. Who? Bibi. Yeah. Yes. The answer is yes. OK? So with the dollar, the $20, I had it, Lisa didn't, and either did you. That, my friends, is at the root of capitalism. It's absolutely at the root of philanthropy. I have it and you don't. Let's create a system by which I could give it to you. Voila, philanthropy. The physical phone, same thing. Lowell gave it to me, I have it, he doesn't. But the data, who else besides the NSA, Apple, Facebook, the Russians, all those, all those humane, who else has it? Right now, right this second. I do and Lowell has it. That is as different from money as an economic resource can possibly get. Remember, Lisa gave me the money. I had it. She didn't. There's, there's the root of modern life up until about 45 years ago. It's the kind of resource that one person can have and somebody else can't. But when it comes to the data, not only do I have it and Lowell has it simultaneously in two different places. Look, he's playing with it right now. All these other groups have it. I'm going to give Lowell back his phone. You all witnessed it. I don't have it anymore. OK? That is as different from money as land is from water. And that's the economy we live in now. So it's not just Facebook. Sure, it's Facebook. But it's all those other actors. And because every one of you said you had a cell phone, I assume how many people in your organization, how many of you work at organizations where everybody has email addresses? You are dependent on those systems all day, every day, for everything you do at your foundation. And yet you are operating in an economy and in an environment that is completely intermediated all the time by organizations you have no control over. So David talked about privacy. I'm talking about agency. We've heard a lot of mention of the word community here. I want you to understand that unless you take hold of the opportunity to shape these things for your own purpose, you have no agency. You have no privacy. You can, but if you use them the way they're delivered to you, they are not designed to align with the mission of your foundation. They are designed to align with the mission of the company that sold them to you and the government in which, whose country you're actually registered or something, I don't know. All those countries, all those countries. So you need to understand how they work. Every one of us is dependent on them, and your missions obligate you to make sure that you're using them in ways that are actually in line with your mission and not compromising your work. OK. So <laughs> David, uh, that was a almost Talmudic uh, explanation of, of how data and privacy interact with our traditional understandings of them and agency. How, is we, how should we as Jews uh, respond to that? How can we as a community, and particularly the people in this room who have a great deal of agency in uh, shaping and reshaping the culture in which we live, how can we start to turn the ship in a positive direction? But I want to ask specifically from a Jewish perspective um, where we can be players in this. Well, the part of it is that the, the transparency or the seeming transparency of social media allows you to do lots of things that are really quite wonderful, right? I can teach thousands of people about privacy, whereas before, you know, going back 150 years, I could give that sermon to my synagogue and maybe write it and get it printed and read. Um, and yet, the paradox of this is, as you all know, that it's not like there's a grand explosion of Jewish literacy. There's only a grand explosion of the tools of Jewish literacy. So one of the questions is, what doesn't just enable Jewish learning, but what promotes it. And those are two different things. Because as you heard that, you know, someone was, was, was talking before about how Jews were looking for, for a Jewish blessing 
Um, and that immediacy of connection between two people who know the same texts and have the same background, that's very powerful. But my guess is that most people, even in the funding world, if you ask them, they would say their Jewish learning isn't up to par with their learning in various other fields. So one is, Safari is a good example. You have to weaponize, if you will, um, social media to actually spread information and knowledge. And that's a, a profoundly Jewish, um, Jewish goal. And then the second is that there have to be counter voices to the things on social media that make it that make it appeal to the lowest common denominator of human beings, which is, after all, part of what's built into any capitalist system, is I want to do something that will get more people easily enmeshed. And I don't know how you design technology to foil technology, although that's an interesting question. Um, but that's what, what, I mean, people, for example, who fund groups that go out to the desert and have a thousand people at a Shabbos dinner at Burning Man, right? All of whom, when they, all of whom are very tech savvy and very digitally connected, but feel a deep need to escape it. That seems to me a very Jewish um, enterprise. Not necessarily Burning Man, but a Jewish enterprise to try to create communities that are technology not that are technology separate, that are not that are not technology dependent. Um, and then, as I said, to use technology to actually enact traditional Jewish values, primary among which I have to say is learning, because a Jewish community that doesn't know what Judaism is in a generation or two will vanish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I will say uh, thank you for mentioning Safaria. Sure. Uh, at Safaria, we're like, because we're a Jewish organization, we're an organization that worries a lot. and. Right. We worry a lot about the fact that when you bring change into the world, you accept responsibility not only for the intended consequences, but for the unintended consequences. And so we're constantly asking ourselves, um, what are the unintended consequences of what we're doing? Um, how in our efforts to make Jewish learning more democratic are we undermining possibly other things that are also important? And I actually would love to give you an opportunity, both of you, um, to offer a critique of maybe, I mean, I, I think what we're doing with Safari is one of the interesting things. There are a number of interesting digital first Jewish initiatives that have been brought in to existence by right. the funders in this room. Yep. Uh, I'd love to give you an opportunity to offer a critique not only of Safari, but of other Jewish uh, endeavors online. Do you want to start? So um, David, you mentioned you don't know about using technology to fight technology. And I think there are times when actually designing, deliberately, deliberately designing an alternative technological solution to an existing mass market one um, is an appropriate answer. But m most often, I think, and this is where I know everybody in this room knows how to do this, it's actually about how you use the existing technology. So I haven't dug in into the terms of service and the privacy agreement on Safaria. Um, so let me ask you right here in front of all our friends, where is the data stored? All the data that's collected every time I click or scroll through, all the granular data about how, which is identifiable to my device and says, this is what Lucy's trying to learn. Where is that data stored? I actually don't know that I can answer that in the most technical uh, sense. Is it I, on your private servers is, or in the cloud somewhere probably I at think Jeff it's in Bezos' the, house? No, it's in the cloud somewhere. But I will say um, one of the places in which Safaria has tried to be a model yep. is in upholding uh, the norms yep. of digital civil society that you write about okay. in terms of openness and uh, respecting privacy and and one of the things that is very scary for us at Safari, one more thing for us to worry about, is everything that we have built is built open source. All of our data is in the commons. Uh, at any given point, somebody could take everything that we've built and replicate it yep. right. and put us out of business, theoretically. Yep. 
uh, we have built our own sort of comp competition. And that's scary, and it required a different way of thinking. It required uh, convincing our funders of a different way of thinking. But we see it as part of our mission, not just to advance Jewish learning, but to advance some of these norms that you've talked about, which I think are so important. And one of the things that we talk about when we go to funders is, look, if you're going to be investing communal resources in new initiatives, you have an obligation to make sure that these kinds of norms are being upheld. Because the one area where the, this room has so much leverage is in reshaping norms. Yes. Because that, you can, this room can go to the, your grantees, and as a grantee, I don't know how I feel about this, but you can say, if you want our money, you have to uphold these norms. And there is so much need right now for projects in the digital space, particularly, to accept new norms. That one of the reasons I'm so excited to be on this panel with you is to give you an opportunity to, tell, to share with this group what they need to be telling to their grantees. Well, that is, thank you, and that is incredibly important. There are, that's exactly right, that funders in particular need to understand the nature of, that's why I do the phone thing, so that you get it. Hopefully that shook you up a little, to realize that when you're contracting with your grantees about money, you also now need to be thinking about what are you asking them to do with the data, and it would be really, crazy, actually, if you'd taken the other tact and tried to make the Torah proprietary. So that one, I'm not so sure what it was. That tact was tried. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's why we had to come right? into existence. But um, it takes really thinking about this at many levels, because uh, as, a, as someone running an organization, storing your information, not just the Torah and the commentary and all of that, that data, of course, should be open and available. But for the people who are using it, the the two people studying Torah with the safari or me and my rabbi, whoever it is, the data that I generate from that learning experience, I would, uh, you asked for a critique, I would suggest strongly that you investigate how can the organization and the software tool be clear and honest with me as a user about what's happening with that data and ideally give me a very easy way to say, I would prefer that you not have it. Because what I'm engaged in here is a learning process. And I don't know about you, but the last time I tried to learn something, I failed a thousand times before I got anywhere. Right? I make mistakes. That's how we learn. So I don't want you to have that. So I, I want to give you two, since I, I'm, I'm not a technology expert, I want to give you two content things that I think Jewish funding should somehow figure out how to do. The first is, Irit said at the beginning, Anashim tovim be'emtza haderech. And she said, you know, you meet good people along the way. But the other way you could translate that is good people are in the middle of the road. And if people could design a way to communicate that encourages moderation as opposed to encouraging extremism, which is what almost every current app does, that would be a tremendous addition to civil discourse. The other thing, and I see this especially because I counsel a lot of young people, and, and I can't counsel people out of this, but there was a time when a camera focused out. <laughs> and now, by the time a girl is 13, 14, 15 years old, she has taken thousands of pictures of herself, which first of all tells her what is valuable to the world about her. It's what she looks like. And second, encourages an almost, um, a, 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 an almost compulsive but brittle narcissism that is at odds with every Jewish value. And, and our society cheers this on, as you all know. And it's very bad for men and for women, um, but it's just very bad. So in the same way that if there was a conversation that actually encouraged people to move to the center, if there was a social media that encouraged the view of the other, instead of always the presentation of the self. And I can't begin to tell you how to do that, because I have no idea. I just know that it is desperately needed. Um, you know, uh, the guys who invented Tinder are actually members of my congregation. <laughs> 
And I've had discussions with them about this and about what it does to people to judge them instantaneously in such a way. And, and yet those conversations don't do anything to diminish the power of that. I mean, we do it in normal conversation, but usually you're still standing there the second after the person has judged you and you get to say something to them so that they can make a second judgment and a third judgment. So maybe part of what an app would be that would help conversation is one that actually doesn't allow you to dismiss somebody in a second. Maybe in order to get on this app, you have to talk to someone for three minutes. I wonder if that would be possible to technologically work. That would be an app, or even five minutes. Um, that would be an app I could get behind. Let me just be clear. There's nothing about technology that makes any of that even difficult. Not only is it possible, it's easy. It's the business model of the commercial sector that makes that it makes unprofitable. So there's even more reason to be thinking about within a community of values how, how you can use these. If you have learned to read and write in one language, two language, or three languages, you have learned the basics of software coding. And from those basic skills, you apply the same kind of logic. You get all of Western literature and you get the Torah. You can have what you want if it's about digital. You just may not be able to have the business model that has taken over the world in the last 10 years. Yeah, I think you made it sound a little too easy. I mean, uh, part, of the, part of our assignment here is to talk not just theoretically but practically about what uh, this room and this community can do. And I have seen from inside of Safaria yeah. that to build a great product, you need great technologists. Yes. And technologists who think like humanists are the people that we're trying to find. Yep. And I think we've done a good job at. And you know, we talk about the a pipeline of leadership, a crisis in you know Jewish communal life. Where are we going to get our next? Uh, executive directors and lay leaders for this community. I also would ask, where are we going to get our next generation of technologists? Because if you are undertaking an initiative whose goal is to reach people and influence people, today that means you're going to be doing something online. Yep. Maybe you're going to be digital first, as Safari is. And that requires a very different kind of leadership and a very different kind of training. And it's not just the case that anybody can sit down and learn to code and make something no. great online. It's actually a skill that very few people have and that is a, in high demand. And yes. you're competing against Facebook and Google yeah. and these companies for talent. So one but, question I would have for this group is how do, we, how do we cultivate that and make sure that we're going to be able to play at a high level right. in the years to come? Absolutely, there's a pipeline problem uh, in training technologists, and there's a competition problem. But what they, the be and we need to invest in that, and there's a new movement uh, among universities on public interest technology, which I wish they'd actually stuck with the name humanist technology, or, but that's moving. But don't, what I'm trying to say is, you have an expertise that brings, that needs to be brought to the table too, and by you I mean you, which is whatever your mission is. And there are people in those companies, there are people who need to be trained to, to, to learn that. But this is not about taking a tech and, and having it just work. You have to actually bring an equal amount of the, the mission and the technology. And you have to design then the technology to serve the mission. And most of the, all of the off the shelf stuff is designed to sell advertising. So there's two different questions being asked here. There's what can this community do about specific technology for this community? And then you were referencing, David, much more about the fact that the members of whatever the Jewish community is, and I never know what that is, um, are also on these tools and living their lives in these other ways. Right. And that's just is. And I think there's also a responsibility. I think there's a bigger responsibility, Josh. It's not just to design technologies that serve us but to make sure that the values of people are represented in those mass market technologies. They have caused a lot of problems, and they're catching up to it. But we need to get engaged directly in those conversations as well. Well, it, it, so, it sounds like, at least in part, the funding of technology of STEM people with 
for values is uh, desperately needed. I mean, I don't know of a Jewish values technology initiative, such a thing may exist and may get launched today. Um, but, but if you know that people who are essentially shaping the arena in which the discourse is going to happen are technologists, then yes. you want those people to come into technology with a value system before they become yes. the shapers Absolutely. of that arena. So I would say on college campuses and maybe in graduate schools and maybe in high schools that, that if we could identify the kids who are technologically gifted, does that sound right, technologically gifted? Um, who are trained. gifted in technology, how about trained. that? Um, and, and encourage them through scholarships or other things to, to have an ethics and values training the same way, by the way, that we do with doctors in medical school these days and didn't used to be the case. That would be an initiative that I think could have tremendous impact. One of the things that I always used to say about being a rabbi in Los Angeles, and I think it's certainly true about being in, in San Francisco now for a different reason, is if you nudge the culture in Los Angeles a little bit, because the city is so globally influential through media, you can make a real difference. And the same thing is true here. If you nudge the technological culture, which granted is worldwide, but still this is the center, a little bit, the difference is exponentially enormous. So think about who is it that you want to give a Jewish values training to most desperately. It's to the people who are going to create not just the discourse, but the structure of the discourse in the next, in the years ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, to come back to a question I'd asked earlier was, uh, I, I was inviting a critique, not just of Safari, but of, of the, how the Jewish world uh, lives online right now. Right. And personally, I am kind of disappointed with what we have to offer. I think uh, we've got very few digital first initiatives, right. uh, things that originated as uh, projects that were going to live online. And when we have uh, you know, IRL, in real life organizations that are trying to do things online, they often don't do them very successfully. Uh, our level of excellence is not that high. And I think that is an open question for this group. How do we solve that problem? I think one of the things that I've learned from my experience with Safaria is that if you want to be creating something online, it is a totally different process. Mm -hmm. You can't outsource that to some third party agency, create, create the digital version of this and put it online and make it great and then launch it and then we'll come back to you in three years when it's time to revise it. The process of creating great products online requires constant iteration, it requires constantly listening, it requires experimentation, and we're not built as a community to deliver on that, and we're going up against companies that are worth hundreds of billions of dollars and have hundreds right. of thousands of engineers who, whose job it is to beat us and to take our attention and take our brain space. Um, so I think that's one of the real challenges. I want to end, because we've only got a minute and 39 seconds left, by giving each of you an opportunity to speak to something that you are optimistic about in this realm. I'm never the optimist, ever. Um, I'm optimistic because um, I, in 30 minutes, I think this conversation we haven't talked before went deeper than it usually does. I think you have to be, I think to design technology to serve a community purpose, a, a shared purpose. You have to be very clear on what that purpose is. And I think this group can do that. I'll be optimistic about that. Um, I'm going to be optimistic in the following way. <clears throat> this week is Purim. Things can look very bad sometimes. <laughs> and they can be quickly reversed. And the truth is that the, that that is true even, I mean, at this moment, I understand that there are three or four or five companies that seem overarchingly dominant in the world of technology. But we, anybody who studies history, has to understand that things change very fast and can change very fast. And that which seems ubiquitous today can be gone tomorrow. And so you shouldn't get discouraged about insurgent initiatives because there are those giants out there. 
You know, the day before the Soviet Union collapsed, nobody knew the Soviet Union was going to collapse. All these experts who had studied it forever thought that it was virtually eternal. That can be seen, obviously, as a, as a, a council of desperation, but it's also a council of hope. There are things that we worry about now that we won't have to worry about in two years, five years, or 10 years. There are things that seem dominant now that will be gone. And if you see the future not as something that is given, but as something that is shaped, and also you understand that the people who shaped it are people, are people, then you have the power to do it as well. I wouldn't say that I'm op optimistic, because that assumes that things will be good. But I am hopeful, because that means that we have the possibility to make them better. That's beautiful, and we should end it there. Thank you.